Our next speaker is uh, Professor Calvin Lin. He's been in the department for nearly 20 years. His research takes a broad approach to increasing programmer, programmer productivity by improving system performance, correctness, and ease of programming. For many of our alumni here today, he's probably equally well known for his work as founder and director of the Turing Scholars Honors Program, which is a phenomenally successful uh, honors program that's now in its 13th year. Calvin. Thank you. <laughs> All right, well, we have a real treat because um, after Amir just told you about the mysteries of the universe and his lifelong goals, uh, I have a, the perfect talk about a small, meager, overstudied little problem. Uh, this is going to be work with uh, Akasha Jane, and I think what you'll find is even though it is a small, very narrow problem, it's incredibly exciting, and it has some... Uh, words of wisdom for us as we look to the future, okay? And so before I start, um, I didn't know there was supposed to be a big idea here, but if you, there's going to be a big idea here, we first have to give you some context. And so since this is our 50th anniversary, I thought it was fitting for us to think back to what Austin was like 50 years ago. Um, and you can see the skyline was quite different. And it's actually quite fitting, it's quite fitting that 50 years, our department's 50 years old because that same year, is where our story starts. Our story starts with Laszlo Bellotti, who in 1966 uh, developed a provably optimal cash replacement algorithm. So the problem he's solving is you want to stick something new in the cache. Which items should I revict from the cache? Okay. And his solution was very simple. He, whoops, sorry. I, uh, he wants to evict the line that's ex accessed furthest in the future. And uh, the only problem, of course, is that it's impractical. <laughs> and so in the past 50 years, we've had a few papers on this topic. And this actually only showed the last 20 years. I'm not sure what happened in the late 90s there, but uh, we didn't want to squeeze on all the previous 30 years. Um, but the point is there's been a lot of work in trying to create practical cash replacement algorithms. And the key point here is that uh, while these techniques have gotten increasingly sophisticated, at the core, they all rely on just a couple of heuristics that make assumptions about the underlying access pattern, okay? And the problem with that is that these heuristics can be wrong, and when the heuristics are wrong, the, the, the techniques don't work very well, okay? So to show you this, I've got a graph here, and there's a lot going on here, but first let me just, there's just three important points. First one is, on all the graphs I show you, I've only got like 30 graphs, higher is better. Okay. The second point here is that these colored graphs, colored bars, which represent the state of the art as of about a year ago, they all suffer from these pathologies where they're getting behavior performance that's lower than the LRU baseline. And then finally, the white bar represents Bellotti's optimal algorithm. It, of course, never goes below LRU because it's proven to be optimal. And you can see that there's quite a gap between the optimal, the white bar, and the practical uh, policies. Okay, so as Akash and I started to work on this, we decided we wanted to do something completely different. Okay, we did not want to build on heuristics because we didn't want to be, uh, suffer these pathologies. And we also wanted, of course, to try to close this gap between, uh, between practical solutions and op. And so our solution is to actually use op in our solution. Okay, well, I just told you this is really not possible. And so, yeah, we scratched our head and said, look, we're here, we're trying to make a decision, what should we do? We're into the future. But what we can do is we can apply the optimal solution to the past. And by doing that, we can learn what the optimal algorithm does on past behavior. And if the past behavior predicts future behavior, we can actually predict what, these, what the future behavior should be. Um, and the first problem with this, of course, is that the optimal solution looks arbitrarily far into the future. So it's possible that our solution might have to look arbitrarily far in the past, meaning we might have to keep an arbitrarily long history of information. So we did a little study, and this is for the spec benchmarks, and uh, the access got garbled here. But what we've done is we took the optimal algorithm, and we've crippled it to limit it, restrict its view of the future. Okay, and so the x-axis represents how much of the future the optimal algorithm gets to look at. And it's all defined in terms of the capacity of the cache. So let's say you have a one megabyte last level cache. 
one X represents one million new items inserted into the cache. Okay? And what we see here is, again, X higher is better, is that this blue bar shows you what happens. And we see that for very small window sizes, the optimal algorithm actually does worse than the LRU baseline. But if you give it an infinite amount of, of, uh, of a window, it actually goes to 100%, which is what Pilates does. So the thing is, we don't need an infinite size window. We can actually get by with something that's 8x the size of the cache. And if we do that, we get to about 95% of optimal's of Bilotti's optimal behavior. Okay. So uh, this tells us, oh yeah, so our, our, our solution is called Hawkeye. And it's called Hawkeye because hawks have great vision. They can see eight times better than the best humans. Okay, so what are the challenges for Hawkeye? There are two challenges. The first one is we've got this long history of information and we have to represent it very compactly. And I won't say too much about this except that we can use um, some, some well-known sampling techniques that other people have used in caching and we can get a very practical solution. So for example, for a two megabyte cache, we uh, store a very reasonable 12 kilobytes of storage, which is completely practical. The other problem is that we need to actually compute Bilotti's algorithm. And nobody's ever, I don't, Think, thought too much about the complexity of Bilotti's algorithm because nobody you know, thought they'd ever use it. But it turns out it's an n squared algorithm and it's n squared over this huge eight megabyte window, right? So that's not very good. So what we needed to do was create a new algorithm that was much more efficient and it's, we came up with a linear time algorithm that's called OpGen because it's generating an optimal solution. And I'll say a few words about that in a minute by showing you an example. But first let me show you our overall structure of our uh, solution. And that is, uh, here's what it is. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna first learn from a stream of memory accesses. So this is all in hardware, it's all online, okay? We're gonna have, run our opt-in algorithm on a, on a stream of accesses, and we're gonna learn what the what Bilotti's algorithm would have done on that past history of events, okay? We're gonna use this information to train a predictor, the Hawkeye predictor, which is going to be, take as input a PC that is the instruction of the load address, and figure out whether that instruction tends to load things that were kept in the cache by the optimal policy or evicted from the cache by the optimal policy, whether it was cache friendly or cache reverse. And then what happens is when we see a new load by the same PC, then we consult our little table and say, oh, was it cache friendly or cache reverse? If it's cache friendly, we stick it into the cache with high priority. If it's cache reverse, we place it in the cache with very low priority. And when we need to make an eviction, we choose one of the cache reverse uh, lines to evict first, okay? So it turns out this works very well, and, and, and the key behind this is this fast opt-in algorithm, okay? And so let me show you this by just giving you an example, okay? The, I, the main um, idea behind this is gonna be a notion of a liveness interval, and all liveness interval is, it's the beginning point and the end point of a period of time during which a cache line might reside in the cache, okay? And Bilotti's insight says that a line that's used more recently in the future should be given higher priority than a line that's used furthest in the future. So the way our algorithm works is it considers cache lines that are reused earliest and then moves forward in time. So here's an example. So in this picture, we're, we're showing a, a very modern cache. It ca can hold two lines. And we're showing a sequence of cache lines, A, B, C, D, and so forth. And we're gonna start with the first reuse. So we'll see here that cache line C is reused, and the question we're asking Bilotti's algorithm is, or opgen, is there room in the cache for C? And of course, since there's nothing in the cache, there clearly is space for C, so we put it in the cache and move on. And we, we record the fact that the PC that loaded this was a hit. Uh, then we look at the next reuse, and I, I'm sorry they don't line up well, but this is, uh, uh, cache line D, and that's its, inter, uh, its uh, liveness interval. And we see that clearly there's room for both for D as well, so we declare that to be a hit. Now we get an interesting one where we try to reuse um, <laughs> A. Imagine in your mind that this line lines up with the A there. Uh, and this is A's liveness interval. Now we see that during this interval, it's never the case that there's more than one thing in the cache, because of course C and D are never live together, so they can share one cache line. So in fact, there is space for A and for C and for D in this cache, we consider that a hit. And finally, if there's another line D, we look at B's liveness interval, and in fact, now we get in trouble because there are two points in time here where the capacity of the cache has already been matched 
so there's no room for B. So we conclude that the optimal algorithm would not have had space for B, and therefore it would be a miss. And that's basically our algorithm. Okay. All right. So uh, we then evaluated our work. Oh, I should point out that uh, this algorithm is completely equivalent to the Bilotti's optimal algorithm in terms of its, its results, its, what, it, what it produces. When we restrict it to looking at an 8x window, it gets 95% of, of, of the optimal solution. Okay. So how do we do? This is the graph I showed you before. Okay. And now we're going to show you in blue the Hawkeye results. And you can see here that we do pretty well. We're actually quite a bit better than them. Uh, but if we put op on there, we see there's still a large gap to op. Okay? So um, I think there are many reasons to say that this is a success. If we look at multi-core results, we see that uh, the, the benefit of Hawkeye grows as we grow the number of cores. So for example, for four cores, we're getting a 15% speed up over LRU, which is, which is quite significant. Uh, and I guess I should say, uh, if you talk to hardware vendors, they will say that if you can get 15% improvement in performance from one generation of technology to another, you're doing great. And so you, one way to look at this is instead of investing all that money in new fabs and new technology and going from you know 18 nanometers to 12 nanometers or whatever, you can, if you can get 15% improvement by changing your cash replacement policy, that's a huge win. Okay. So um, there's still, of course, this large gap between Hawkeye and Op. And so the question now is, well, can we do better? And this is where I think uh, the, uh, the excitement for the future comes in. Okay? Um, and so we think the answer is yes. And the big picture is this. What we've done with Hawkeye is really viewed or formulated the cash replacement problem as a supervised learning problem. And those of you who know about AI know that the supervised learning problem says, how do we learn from labeled training data? Okay? And the uh, uh, advancement here is that our opt-in algorithm is, is the mechanism that provides the labeled training data. So in supervised learning, and I'm just learning this stuff now, um, the way you design a solution is you design, you first you determine your labels. What is it that we're trying to predict? In our case, we're trying to predict whether cash lines were hit or misses. Uh, you also have to define the input features. That is, what are you going to associate with your inputs as inputs to your function? In our case, it was the load PCs. And then finally, you need a, a machine learning algorithm. So to put this in context of Hawkeye, uh, as I said, our features are the PC, our, our labels are hits and misses, and our learning algorithm is very trivial. It's just a table lookup. And this table lookups, by the way, are what architects always do when they try to learn things. Okay? Well, not always, almost always. Um, and so the nice thing, though, is that once we can view this as a supervised learning problem, we can hopefully leverage all the uh, amazing work that's been done in supervised learning to try to find better solutions. So as we want, try to find ways to improve Hawkeye, we can look at ways to improve every aspect of this learning system, supervised learning system. So for example, one thing we can do instead of looking at, um, sorry about this, this is, let's see, uh, okay. <laughs> um, Instead of using the PC as a feature, we can look for other features that might better predict behavior. And I'll say just a few words about that in a second. Instead of looking at whether a cast line is hit or miss, which is a very coarse-grained behavior, we can actually look to see, whoops. Uh, OK, we can look to see how many lines a cast, an instruction actually allocates. So instruction 12 allocates you know, half a megabyte and Instruction 24 accesses one kilobyte, and we'd like to, be able to predict those values. That, of course, is a much harder learning problem. And then the final thing is instead of using the table lookup, uh, we can try to use machine learning algorithms such as decision trees. Okay. So, um, and by the way, I apologize for all the animations. This was the uh, wonders of, move, of developing on a, on a Windows machine and moving to a Mac. Okay. All right. So. We've uh, recently been fortunate to have uh, Qi Xing Huang join our faculty, who does machine learning. And he's showing us how we can do a better job. And so to just give you one hint that, that we can do better, we looked at this question of what should the features of the input function be instead of the PC. And so what we did is we considered 36 different features, and we used some decision trees to learn offline which of those features were best for predicting our problem. And of course, this is a very expensive uh, procedure. That's why we're doing it offline rather than doing it in hardware. Okay? But the, the upshot of that was that we identified three features that, in some sense, roughly correspond to cache occupancy, what's in the cache, which in some ways is actually 
pretty fun, pretty uh, profound because there are no other cash replacement policy actually tries to reason about what's in the cash. Okay, uh, and in, in just working on this for a few weeks, a counselor was able to get the accuracy of our predictor from 81% up to 88%. And Chi Xing says, oh, don't worry, when we start throwing deep learning at it, it's going to go way up. And he keeps saying it's going to go up to like 90%, 95%. So, so we shall see. Um, uh, and the bottom line, though, is that, uh, well, first of all, we have great confidence in Chi Xing. But there are, there's, as, 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 uh, as proud as we were of Hawkeye, there's just tremendous growth in applying these machine learning algorithms, potential for growth. Okay, so we think that we can put, continue to close this gap. But now the question might be, well, okay, so let's say you close the gap. And let's say we're right. Can we actually exceed the gap? Okay, and the answer is, well, yeah, of course we can. So here's what we're going to do. Um, the optimal algorithm is really only optimal under the assumption that all your, the cost of loading your, your cache is uniform, which of course is not true. And so we have uh, one of our amazing Tony scholars working on this problem with us, and it's looking at the notion of a cash replacement algorithm that takes uh, the latency of the cost of the load into account. And so what these graphs just show you is that if you use, instead of Bilotti's optimal algorithm, a cost-aware optimal algorithm for a couple different benchmarks, you can see you, you can do quite a bit better than optimal. So in other words, just, I don't know, 15% better than or 40% better than not, depending on the distribution of your loads. Okay, so how does this work? Well, we're going to have the same structure as Hawkeye, but instead of learning from opt or Bellotti's algorithm, we'll learn from this uh, cost-aware opt. Uh, much of the other machinery will look the same, except for it's a much harder problem, so we're going to need more sophisticated machine learning techniques. But we hope that even if we don't come anywhere near uh, the blue line, we'll still be above opt, which would be pretty nice. Okay, so um, to sum up, let me say that we think there are many, many other applications of this idea. We can look at many hardware optimizations and view them as supervised learning problems, which will then allow us to apply similar techniques. And uh, to conclude, I would just point out that even though it's this ancient, teeny little problem, cash replacement is not dead, and we think there's actually some very exciting work to be done. And more importantly, uh, if we can harness the power of machine learning, we can study much more harder problems. We can study problems that are really difficult to solve by just human ingenuity, which is what architects currently do. And we can um, study design spaces that are much richer than what we can do with our current techniques. And with that, I think uh, I will thank you.